Thank you very much for the invitation to talk today. Um, I'll be talking about abdominal pain in hypermobility, ehlers danlos syndrome, and how it's associated with proliferation of colonic nociceptive nerve endings. So just to start off with, hypermobility type ehlers danlos syndrome, otherwise known as HEDS, which is what I'll be referring to it from now on, is characterized by a flexibility of the skin and the joints, as you can see in the image over here. Um, although this may be very useful as a party trick or in certain professions very useful, um, it does come with a lot of GI symptoms. And these GI symptoms are also present in uh, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. So they manifest with both upper GI and lower GI symptoms. The upper GI symptoms include nausea, dyspepsia and reflux, and the lower GI symptoms include constipation and or diarrhea, GI dysmotility, recto evacuate dysfunction and also abdominal pain. Um, abdominal pain is a subject uh, of our study today, and it's one of the key symptoms in diagnosing IBS using the Rome criteria. At the moment, uh, the, the uh, genetic cause of hypermobility EDS is currently unknown. However, a subset of patients do have a deficiency in an extracellular matrix protein called tenacin X. So I'll tell you a little bit about what tenacin X does. Um, it's been identified both in patients and mice, um, and in the literature, there are some case studies that uh, discuss the tenacinix deficient patients. And similarly to the HEDS patients, we see this hyperflexibility of the skin and the joints. Um, uh, this is also true in the TNX deficient mice. In the picture here, you can see that quite clearly which uh, mouses are deficient mouse with the stretchy skin. And also this is uh, the stretchiness that you see in the tenacinix deficient patient. Interestingly, in the tenacinix deficient group, um, in the patients, you see a host of GI problems, again, including abdominal pain, severe constipation, recurrent rectal prolapse, and other GI associations, such as hiatus hernia, diverticular disease, and gastric ulceration. In the tenacinix deficient mice, studies have been done, but they're not uh, GI-related. However, they've been shown to be important uh, factor in wound healing. Uh, tenacinix is also uh, an, described as an anti-adhesive molecule, um, thought to impede the invasion and metastases of tumor cells and finally associated with blood vessel formation in peripheral nerves. So there's a lack of studies in the TNX deficient mice uh, in terms of gut function. So just a quick overview, overview of what tenacins actually are. They belong to a family of extracellular matrix glycoproteins, and there are four major subtypes, tenacin C, tenacin R, tenacin W, and tenacin X. As I mentioned before, tenacin X, uh, or any tenacins actually, have not been studied very well in the gastrointestinal tract, uh, and indeed the enteric nervous system. However, in the central nervous system, a little bit more has been done on other tenacins, for example, tenacin R. Tenacin R is um, part of a host of other ECM molecules and forms a structure called a perineuronal net. These perineuronal nets surround uh, the neuronal cell bodies and are very important for synaptic plasticity. So um, based on the lack of studies of tenacin X, particularly in the GI tract, we decided to characterize uh, the expression pattern of this protein in both the mouse and the human gut. So here's just an example showing you uh, the mouse distal colon, um, and you can see tenacin X in the red here, and these are different neuronal markers that we've used to co-label with. Um, and we showed that, firstly, the interesting thing that we found is TNX is actually found within neuronal cell bodies and not in the extracellular matrix, um, as one would expect. And not only is TNX found in cell bodies, uh, and, sorry, neuronal structures, it's also associated with the subpopulation of neurons. So I'll just quickly run through this, um, this picture here. So TNX, again, here in the submucous plexus, you can see it's found within the neuronal cell bodies, um, and it quite nicely co-labels with uh, a marker called calretinin. In the myenteric plexus, TNX co-labels with NOS positive cell bodies, but to a lesser extent than um, calretinin. And here in the final uh, panel here, you can see TNX again within the neuronal cell bodies and the CGRP fibers surrounding the ganglia, but not within the cell bodies. However, the apposition to TNX and CGRP is quite close by. When we quantify this data, you, you, we, see them, we count the mean number of neurons that co-labeled with TNX, um, and this is in the myenteric plexus and the submucous plexus, and you can see that TNX co-labels quite nicely with calretinin and CAT-positive neurons, which is, uh, identifies the cholinergic neurons, to a lesser extent of the NOS. And uh, CGRP here, there's very few or no co-labeling um, due to the location of CGRP around in fibers um, and TNX within neurons. But again, there is a close uh, relationship between the two. So uh, briefly, we obtained the tenacinix knockout mice, um, and we looked at gross anatomy of the mice. 
and we saw that in about 12% of the tenacinic snowcat mice, there was an internal rectal prolapse. So this was within, within the rectum in itself, indicated by the blue arrow here. Uh, the wild type counterparts had no, no prolapse in all the experiments that we performed. And this is quite similar to what we see in the tenacinic deficient patients where they, where they got recurrent rectal prolapses. Um, we went on to look at colonic motility studies. And on the bottom here, you can see two graphs, uh, raw traces from the wild type and the knockout colon. And um, each of these colors represent a, a different region of the colon. So from the proximal all the way down to the distal colon. Um, using these, uh, this motility study, we can do various types of analysis, including contraction, uh, amplitude, area of the curve. But here, just uh, for time, I'm just showing you the number of peaks per minute. So in the wild type, um, the peaks seem to be very normal and uh, similar to what's published out there. And in the knockout colon, there, there is a significant reduction in the number of contractions, particularly in the mid-proximal and the distal colon. The amplitude of contractions is also significantly reduced. Um, I haven't shown you the graph here, but this is quite obvious, particularly in the distal colon. Uh, in addition to looking at colonic, afferent, um, colonic motility studies, we uh, measured the afferent activity using uh, Spetnik recordings. And here there are two traces. You can see um, a wild type uh, and also a knockout mouse here. Um, and these, uh, these increases you can see are when the colon was actually distended. So we looked at the baseline, these are just very simple experiments, so we just looked at the baseline activity and we saw a significant increase in the tenacinex knockout mouse. And while, while distending the colon, we saw this also a significant increase in the peak firing rate during uh, the actual distension. Um, and this was not due to uh, changes in colonic wall compliance, because as we saw, there was no uh, significant difference. So we can say that this is neuronal rather than um, smooth muscle related. So just a, a quick summary of my previous data. We've shown both in the human and the mouse colon that TNX co-labels mainly with the cholinergic, the cat neurons, um, and contributes towards normal colonic motility. Um, and we saw that TNX is actually mutually exclusive to the sensory neuropeptide CGRP, but again in close opposition to one another. And our electrophysiology studies show that colonic afferent sensitivity is actually increased in the TNX knockout mouse. This leads on to my hypothesis which we think that there are adaptive changes in sensory nociceptive fibers, which cause an increase in visceral hypersensitivity in the TNX knockout mice. Um, and we have two aims. Uh, we wanted to determine if there are indeed adaptive changes in nociceptive sensory fibers uh, in the knockout mouse colon, and establish if actually abdominal pain is in fact correlated in a cohort of tenacinex deficient patients, because so far we've just got case studies to rely on. So to do this, we've used two methods. Uh, first, indirect immunohistochemistry and patient questionnaires. So uh, immunohistochemistry, uh, routine immunohistochemistry, where we dissected the mouse distal colon, we fixed the tissue overnight, cut the sections, labeled them fluorescently, um, and imaged them using an epifluorescent microscope. We did particular fiber analysis using a uh, JCOP plugin, which measures the pixel at the intensity of one pixel over another to give an idea of co-labeling. The patient questionnaires, we sent them a global symptom severity questionnaire, uh, otherwise known as a GSRS, and this scores uh, symptoms for five different GI domains. So reflux, abdominal pain, which is what we're interested in, constipation, indigestion, and diarrhea. These scores range from one, which has no symptoms at all, to seven, which is unbearable symptoms. So I'll start off with showing you some of the immunohistochemistry data that we've obtained. Um, we first used PGP 9.5 as our pan-neuronal marker, I'm not sure you can see clearly there, but um, I can see that you, you can quite clearly see that there is an increase in red positive nerve fibers in and around the crypts um, here. But uh, in the wild type, the density of these nerve fibers is reduced. When we measured the mean number of pixels of PGP 9.5, um, we can see that overall the nerve fibers definitely increase in the knockout mucosa. We also uh, looked at the CG with using CGRP doing the exact same study and we found that the nerve I think it's quite clear to see here that the nerve fibers are definitely proliferating in the um, knockout mouse compared to the wild type and this was even more significant than uh, PGP so we suggest that this increase that we see in overall nerve fiber density may be due to CGRP. Um, we also looked at the myenteric plexus using both PGP and CGRP um, and we saw no changes, uh, so it's very diff different to the mucosa, where there's 
PGP is exactly where it should be in the myotrophic plexus, also found in the mucosa. Um, similarly, in the colon, uh, in the knockout mouse colon, it's exactly the same. And CGRP surrounding neuronal cell bodies, um, and it's the same in the knockout. And this is represented graphically here where there's no change. So moving on to the human studies, this is just a, a quick um, summary slide showing each of the domains that we looked at. So overall, GI symptoms increased across all regions. Um, and abdominal pain definitely was a significant increase compared to a, a control group. This uh, brings me on to my conclusions. So we saw proliferation of nerve fibers, including nociceptive fibers, in colonic mucosa of tenacinex knockout mice. Um, TNX, we think, acts as an anti-adhesive molecule. Thus, in the absence of this molecule, there is increased neuronal growth. Um, and similarly to the HEDS patients, we see that tenacinix deficient patients experience significantly more abdominal pain compared to our healthy controls. So we, we know that the mechanisms of pain may be similar in both mouse and in human that lack tenacinix. So some further work, a point some further work, we want to actually measure whether this, the CGR, increased CGRP that we see in the nerve fibers is retained or is it being released, um, released. So we, to do this, we can do CGRP release assays. We also would like to do pelvic colonic recordings because we've done spanknik recordings just to see if this hypersensitivity also persists. Um, we also want to measure nerve growth factors, whether they would change since there is an increase in nerve density. And finally, does hypertrophy of nerve endings also occur in the mucosa of HEDS patients by, by taking colonic biopsies from these patient group to make this uh, study translational? I'd like to thank the, my funders and all the people who I work with in the Wingate Institute. Thank you very much.